everybody. Welcome to the Non-Obvious Beyond Diversity Summit. I'm your host, Monica Samtani. I'm also the founder of Ms. Media and The Fem Word, where we broadcast stories of bold women in creative spaces. And I'm thrilled to partner with the organizers, the team at the Non-Obvious Company. The topic today is Our Body is Power, Creating a Positive Mental Representation of ourselves. And I have the great pleasure to welcome two women, Kate Roberts, a global champion for women's leadership through business, philanthropy, sexual health, and art. And but first, Puja Kumar, an Indian American actress, model, and producer. Hi, Puja. Welcome to the Beyond Diversity Summit. How are you? I'm doing great, Monica. Thank you. And thank you for having me on this uh, wonderful show and this whole organization, the Non-Obvious Diversity Summit. It's it's wonderful. You know, I'm so glad you guys have come together and and really wanting to inspire um, other people in the non-obvious way. Oh, well, thank you. And we're so inspired by you and really excited about this conversation, really because your body of work is interesting and unique. It spans from the U.S., yeah to India, yeah. and you've experienced the industry from two completely different cultures. What has that been like for you? So, you know, being born and brought up um, in America, you know, you're already dealing with so many sort of stereotypical issues of being brown and, and that too in middle America. So um, you're trying to kind of find your own voice. And when you find your own voice, then, you know, your whole body image comes into play. Um, and, you know, being brown in the Midwest wasn't so easy, you know, while being brought up there. So you kind of, you know, looked to other brown women um, in order to, you know, sort of kind of adapt and be part of your schools and part of being part of the organizations that you're wanting to be involved in. And um, luckily, my parents, you know, always brought me up to think it doesn't matter what skin you are, you can do anything that you want. So thank God for them to give me that sort of support and that confidence um, from the get go. Um, yeah, you were you were born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri. Yeah. Yeah. You went yeah. to India every year. So Indian culture was instilled in you yes. from an early yeah. age. But like you're saying, I mean, your parents encouraged you, number one. Number two, you were empowered to make your own choices. Yes. That is an interesting thing, especially growing up with first gen as a first generation Indian American. Well, you know, it's interesting. I always uh, I always gave it as the correlation as as a rebuttal to my mom and dad that you guys came when you were 21. You know, I think you guys are the biggest rebels in the world. I mean, to leave your family and to come halfway across the world uh, without any support system. And at that time, there was no email, there was no uh, phone. I mean, there was a phone, but, you know, you would like take, uh, you know, hello, how are you? Okay, that's it. And then they hang up the phone, right? You'd well, it was like, really expensive to call. Yeah. It was like ten dollars a minute or something <laughs> crazy like that. And and so then, so like the communication, and for them to do that at that time, I said, "Wow, like I'm only kind of following in your footsteps about wanting to do something different, and also expanding our horizons, and also creating opportunities." Um, and, and in that way, you know, like my mom came and, and she married a man that she didn't even know had that arranged marriage that we're also familiar with, mm -hmm. um, but also not familiar with. Right. And um, and she just made it her own. She made America her place and her home and was so secure in who she was. And I think that's so important of like embracing who you are. And that obviously comes with time, but it's so important for the family structure to do that. Like you need your parents to always be encouraging you and to supporting you. You know, I think that's only, that's the only way you can sort of like get forward, but also giving you that space to, you know, go out and be fearless, you know, go out and experience things also where you're not, um, uh, you know, sort of shadowed in this curtain, you know, and, and sort of lived in this protective bubble. So it's difficult for our parents to do, right? Because they came and they only know what they know. And so, so for, for them to adapt and do all those things. So it's yeah, not- I mean, look, they barely know each other. They yeah. don't know the culture here. They moved to the Midwest. Right. They practically no other brown faces around. Yes. And yet they're able to not only survive, but thrive. 
Yeah. And really the women are the pillars in terms of our uh, culture and our, our families. They yeah. were the fearless ones, as you're saying, and they set those examples for us. Absolutely. I mean, my mom, um, you know, she was basically the, the person why, I mean, why I got into this field. Um, I mean, she was an artist herself. And so she encouraged me to go into the arts, um, but also encouraged me to be educated also, right? And make educated um, risks and calculated risks that you're going to want to take. And so that that was sort of embedded in my mind that I was going to do the things that were going to make a difference. They were going to do the things that made me feel comfortable. Um, and also, and then also do the things that, um, were also going to impact people in a different way, you know, cause mm -hmm. being brought up, we didn't have any Brown women on TV, uh, in America, you know, I've said it before, but the only person we had was Persis Kambata. Right. Yes. And they showed her as like a bald woman on star Trek and yes. like, well, no, we're not aliens, you know, we're from <laughs> India. It's just a country. That and yet we were so proud at that time, weren't we? Oh, when so we, proud. we were like, oh my God, an Indian yeah. TV. I was like, see how beautiful Indian women are, yeah. even without their beautiful hair. You know, I was like so happy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and so and, and so seeing that only sort of made me tr like was it made me drive even more towards like yeah. doing things that were different. Um, so talk that's about that. Talk about yeah. that intersection of the two industries. Yeah. And the pressures or expectations, especially around your physical appearance. I, uh, there's a lot of pressure. I mean, there's no doubt. Well, there's a lot of pressure, even if you're not in that industry for women. I mean, right. if you're a little bit overweight, you know, people will make the comments, you know, like in Hindi, especially like if you're a little bit of, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like, yeah. Those small, those subtle things when you're 10, 11, 12, and you're transitioning into like womanhood makes a big difference. Um, but in our industry, you know, it's a visual medium. And so we're so adapted to looking at women and it's in brain, it's like sort of kind of gone into our subconscious that we need to look like this and we need to have this certain size in order to do these roles. Um, and I, and I just, and I was, and I always felt really deeply about that. Why do we need to do that? And I'm going to be able to prove that we can do the roles that we want to at, you know, any stage of your life and, and at, at any weight. Um, I am a firm believer that we should be healthy. Uh, we should take care of ourselves. There's no question, but I'm also not uh, someone who's going to aggravate that you need to be a size zero in order to do any roles, or you need to have a certain, you know, uh, cheekbones or you need to do your eyes need to look a certain way. And I think if you're talented and you work hard, you can overcome those things. Um, I recently had, um, I recently had a baby and congratulations. It, thank you. Thank you. And it changed me because I was so hesitant on having a baby because I was like, Oh, I'm going to get fat. I'm not going to look good. I see all these women who are pregnant who look beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, I've got the Indian woman hits. You know, I can't you know, deny that. And then mm -hmm. afterwards, I thought, my gosh, after I have a baby, what am I going to do? How am I going to look? How am I going to get the roles? Mm -hmm. Well, I already got an offer for a movie. And then I'm also shooting for, you know, this Netflix show. So it, I took. I had all these things in my mind, mm -hmm. which just proved to me were so ridiculous. Well, let's so, go back. Let's go back. And yeah. you're right. I mean, we need to take those ideas out of our own heads. Yes. That yes. we will not, we will be ostracized. We will not be able to continue in our career if we do normal things like having a baby. Yeah. Exactly. You know? um, and I think we've given birth to life and to a future yeah. generation that's going to impact people. And we think so uh, much about how it's going to affect our body. Um, but even while growing up, I always felt like, no, I'm going to do the roles that I want to do. You know, I've done Pakistani TV plays to doing, um, uh, you know, main leads, a romantic lead in Roma uh, with Bollywood Hero with Chris Kattan. And then I've done a Tamil film. So I adapted my look and feel according to the character. And there are no characters I feel or no women who are just the same. So, and that was something where I, I really um, wanted to participate. Let's go back though. If you yeah. think about it, Pooja, 
before the 90s, yes. Hollywood actresses were more curvy. Yeah. They were more relatable. Yes. What Indians would call healthy or healthy. Yeah. <laughs> By the end of the 90s, the acceptable size and shape of women in cinema changed. Yes. With, like the, the, the best example I can think of is Karina Kapoor. Yeah. In Kabi Koshi Kabi Gum. Right. So right. You and I have talked in the past about the fact that you feel you're a normal body type. Yes. Woman. Mm -hmm. Did you ever feel like you did have to be to fight to be seen as that normal body type? I mean, yes. you proved a point that after you had a baby, you still got some pretty badass roles. Yeah. So, well, so but that's now, right? But at that time, mm -hmm. like going back, it wasn't yeah. like that, right? Because right. you're. I think right now the whole body image is changing. I think now women yeah. who are actresses. Um, even in India, it was like at a time where you got married and then you had a kid and you wouldn't be doing any more work, but that's changing there, which I'm so happy about. Um, but it's still, there's a subtlety still there, um, which, you know, while I first started out was there, well, you wouldn't get certain roles if you were a certain body type. And I, and I tried to fight it as much as I could. There were roles that I lost out on, um, but then that didn't that didn't dishearten me um, from stopping, right? And I think the perseverance and I think your own hard work is going to make you kind of step outside of your own boundaries and your comfort zone and change that image. And I think each of us have that like duty to do that and continue to do that, right? Um, Such a great it's not message easy. that you're saying though is that you are, you know, that inner confidence that you know you can do whatever you need to do and not have to succumb to what you think society is telling you you need to look like to be right no if i if i listened to everyone then i wouldn't be doing anything i right. mean no you can't do this how can you be an actress wait you're brown like you're you're in america what how can you even think about doing that there are no roles so you know there's always the naysayers so right. you have to kind of i think and it's in, it's so amazing to me that we still have those sort of voices in our head telling us and even outside people telling us even to this day. And right. it just and and now we've seen, you know, Kamala Harris, who's vice president of the United States. And like she's half Thumble and she's half African-American. And that's I mean, right. What? It's it's amazing. Right. And so it, it's just totally changed the trajectory of what we think about women yeah. and, and their body image. Um and so I'm so happy about things like that. But I think it took steps, right? It right. took women con like constantly being out there and pushing the bar. And, um, and, and look, I feel representation like matters, right? Uja? Yes. And yes. if you can see it, you can be it. Yeah. Um, I want to take everybody back because yes. in uh, 1995, yeah. you were crowned Miss India USA. Mm -hmm. um, and so, <laughs> you know, you're... The real OG here. You're the real queen. I just want to just tell you that in uh, 1983, yeah. I won the DC Miss India contest what? and moved on to New York for the national competition. There I am. Oh. There I am. See the arrow? I love it. Oh my God. Monica, you look great. I love it. Oh, yes. Well, it's so I, cute. So there's the, the lady that won, um, the one next to me. She won the oh. New York uh, national contest wow but there i was that was 1983 oh i won the entire thing miss india usa in 1995 so yeah. after that it seems like you were already doing well but the tra trajectory of your career really went up from there and take and took off especially in india am i yeah. right yes well so you know there weren't that many opportunities here in america you know when i first started um look i became miss india at a time where i wanted to meet other women in america mother other south asian women and um this opportunity just came along and and then i and then i won and i took it as like wow this is like a stepping stone into meeting other people and and expanding my horizons and also like getting better at my skills, right? And, and becoming the artist that I want to be. Um, and that that sort of platform, I was 18 when that happened. And that platform, um, the Miss India Worldwide Pageant, Thermat Masaran, 
they gave me an opportunity, right? And so, and so when I won, it was fantastic and it was, it was great. But, but the biggest thing for me was that um, it just gave me a heightened sense of awareness of what other women were also going through and what other South Asian women were, were, what they were experiencing because we didn't have email at that time, you know, and you didn't have Facebook, we didn't have Instagram. Right. Um, and so that was your way of meeting, you know, other women who were artists or who wanted to do something in the art. So it was great at that time. Um, and I'm so thankful that that happened because it just sort of catapulted in different ways. Right. Now for me, the opportunities came in from India because I could speak Hindi and I could read and write Hindi. And I went to India every year. So that kind of helped me sort of adapt to things over there. But I made a conscious effort of wanting to um, do stuff in India because there weren't that many things happening in America. So did I want to do the one-liner roles, which weren't really happening in the first place? Or do I go and try to do stuff in India where like I can you know, become a better actor, you know, and, and use the skills that, um, that I want to. Right. And obviously like those one liners at the time, yeah. very stereotyped as well. So you yes. make the right decision, but I want to kind of dig deeper into that part of your career because, yeah. um, colorism yes. basically means discrimination against individuals with a darker skin tone doesn't just happen here. It happens in India. Um, yeah. and yeah. I wanted to kind of gauge whether you felt that at all, and what's the story behind that in the Bollywood industry? I mean, you know, look in India already. There is a fairness problem, right? You know, there there is an issue where you want all the girls to be fair and fair and lovely. You know, they want you to be tall and they want you to be fair and they want you to be skinny. And it's like, well, who really is that? I mean, there that doesn't describe your typical Indian woman. Indian women are weedish complexion, right? And so yeah. why wouldn't we be proud of that? Um, and it's sad because it's still, yes, it's very prevalent in India. Um, again, I tried to defy that and say, hey, I can still play the main lead even if I am brown. <laughs> and, and, then, and it didn't stop me again from, from thinking that I was less talented or less hardworking um, from, the, from my opponent who was fair. Um, and so that is, I think, key again, I keep, I know I keep harping on it, but I was like that the drive is so important for you, um, to keep on going, you know, and also one should never, um, feel disappointed because I got rejected all the time. I mean, there were roles that I wanted and I didn't get, and I, and I would get upset that, oh, how could she get it? And, and what was in it in her? Um, that made them think that she was better than I was. And so I stopped sort of in my tracks and, and stopped questioning uh, what my ability was because like, you start questioning that. And then I, and I just realized, I said, well, okay, that's done. Next, moving on. Next, next, and next. And um, you can, you know, you're always going on to the next one because that's what you have to do. Well, so what would you say to girls who may be watching who have aspirations about maybe becoming an actress in terms of keeping true to yourself and that self-esteem and celebrating your body. There's so much that's involved in this industry. It is. I mean, I would say the first thing, my advice is to anyone who wants to go into acting. And if you can think of something else that you want to do with your life, <laughs> then do that. <laughs> it's so, so that is exactly it's funny that you say that because you and I have talked about this being yeah. in the news industry as I was now yes. when people ask me I'm like can you think of something else but I don't actually mean that because we love what we I do I know well I mean and that's the thing um I wasn't and so I hate to I hate to discourage and I don't want women to be discouraged about it. But I also want people to be realistic, you know, their expectations that you have to work very hard and that too consistently. It's a not a nine to five, it's 24 mm seven. -hmm. Um, and there are things you have to work on. You have to work on your acting skills. You have to work on emotions. You have to work on dialects. You have to work on different languages. Um, you know, can you sing? Can you dance? Can you, there's so many things that skills that you have to work on um, to have in your basket because there is so much competition, you know, and it's the only industry where, 
you can be smart, you can be good looking, you can be talented, um, and you can have a great body and you'll still never get a job. Right. <laughs> so I, I always, I want all the girls out there to just like really be educated about what they want to do and think about it seriously and make like a six month plan, a one year and a three year plan you know, That's really um, nice. and then, and then you can attack it, right? Uh, like the way you want to. So. And you're a producer as well. Yes. Talk about the choices that you're making in terms of the stories that you want to tell now. The, I mean, I definitely am a firm believer in, um, in producing your own content. I always have. And I think if you see most of the actors or um, actresses, they end up producing a lot of movies. And I think they all have stories that they want to tell. And personally, I have so many stories that I want to tell. And the way I've looked at the world, I would love to share that vision, you know, with other people. And mainly I want to concentrate on, on women. Um, primarily South Asian women. Um, and, and I think that's because I think we're so interesting. And I think we don't have enough stories that tell us or we or tell us that what are the emotions that we go through while living in America or while living in India, living in, in, in Europe. Um, it's just really interesting to see how we're brought up. Um, and then also when you tell these stories, there's so many women who can like look at those actresses on screen or, or look at those actors on screen and be like, oh my God, that's exactly how I felt or that's exactly what I was experiencing. So um, you can help people in so many ways and then they can figure out in their own life, um, you know, sort of how to tackle problems and challenges. And I think that's the power of cinema, which is why mm -hmm. I always wanted to concentrate on, you know, South Asian women. And I love the idea of using this medium for storytelling because yes. storytelling is transformative. Absolutely. Um, as you know, this conference is dedicated to providing actionable advice yes. to the audience about how to create a more inclusive world, especially as it relates to our body and our power. What would you say are the main takeaways that you would tell our audience? So, you know, the main thing I have always, I've told other people who've kind of wanted some advice or some sort of guidance. And I said, well, look, there are, for actresses in sort of my field, I always said, well, find the, the 50 directors or uh, producers that you um, like. And the way you like them is by watching a lot of movies, by watching, by reading screenplays um, and pick those 50 people you know, that you, that you really sort of want to emulate and then sort of on your free time, um, find out, you know, where they are, email them, talk about their work. Um, you know, ask them, uh, email them about their, the, you've seen their scenes that they, they have written or directed. Um, and then once you sort of get in touch with them and then sort of create that dialogue, it's going to open up your world. And so then, everyone wants to be talked to right and so even directors and producers want to meet new talent they want to meet new store they want to meet new story um storytellers so that would say like that's like an actionable item i would do and it takes some time to do that because you have to watch the work sort of understand it and then sort of put it into words of how you're going to um sort of talk to these producers and directors about so know your craft yes and know yourself yes Yes. Know your craft, know yourself. Absolutely. Perfect combination. Thank you so much for, first of all, this conversation, the work Thank that you. you've done. You're a trailblazer and a change maker and really something, you know, something that people need to hear is your story about how you stay true to yourself. And I yes. think that's so powerful. And I thank you for that. Thank you, Monica so much. And thank you um, for this whole summit and for thinking about me for being part of it. And I hope, you know, that we can all do our little part because it really does make a difference. So thank you. Yes. And I want to thank SRC Partners for introducing us to each other and bringing you into this conference. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, SRC and Rui. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And good luck with everything uh, that you're going to be doing next. Thank you so much to Pooja Kumar. And now I would like to say hello to our next guest, Kate Roberts. Hi, Kate. Hi, Monica. How are you? So great to see you. Likewise. 
you know, I want to tell everybody and start off by saying that you have spent 30 years as a champion for women's leadership and wellness solutions all over the world. And I could truly go on all day long about the difference that you have made across the globe. Well, thank you. Um, I believe that people make a difference, not money. Um, so it's really not just being a champion myself, but also finding other champions uh, to collaborate with because people, people can change the world, especially through themselves. And the people that you have collaborated with look at the idea that it's so important to look at body image as it relates to sexual wellness. Talk to us a little bit about that and the collaborations that you formed around that idea. Sure. Well, first of all, I, I really believe in women, period. When you invest in a, in a woman, you invest in her, her family, her community, the nation, and therefore the world. So it's a great investment to invest in a woman. Um, a woman's body, you know, we're powerhouses, right? We do everything. We make babies, we plan families, we go to work, we manage our families. Um, and so, you know, a woman and her body is very, very powerful and it can do extraordinary things. And for the last uh, 20, 30 years, I have been a champion for this. Uh, I really believe in the girl effect. Um, and, you know, there's, there's stats and there's proven data out there that when you invest in a woman and you invest in her, her body, we will literally change the world. And so for the last 20 odd years, I have been traveling the world, meeting with women, finding innovative solutions around uh, women's sexual reproductive health. Um, which has led me to today with taking a, a private sector approach to really investing in our sexuality, uh, in our health, um, and delivering the much needed products, education, and services we need to thrive as women. So that's a, a little entree into my world. Uh, there's lots of different parts of it. You, you said it yourself, philanthropy, art, health, business, nonprofit, uh, I sort of come up, cover the gamut. And when you, I'm going to take sort of a broad look at all of that work that you've done and then narrow it down to the idea of self-esteem, acceptance, and celebrating our bodies. The basic, I guess, problem is that girls suffer more from body dissatisfaction and how we see ourselves. We're so preoccupied with body image. I mean, even as young girls, it's so common to hear them say, oh, my boobs are too small or my butt is too big. And to be honest, even I grew up with this really weird idea and notion that my knees were ugly. So I wouldn't even wear shorts when I was growing up. It was just, it, it's just incredible. The effect that the idea of body image had on me. Why does this happen to us so much more even than men? It's a huge uh, problem. Uh, it's uh, it's also about the status quo, what we are taught. It's about the education that we have. It's from the parents we come from, but most of all, it is from media. Uh, you know, media put out you know images of you know what who is the perfect woman. But you know, the bottom line is nobody looks like that. A lot of these images are altered uh, and changed, um, or filtered, or you know whatever. Um, I like anybody else, have, have gone through the same problems with not being happy with my body, um, not having the access that I needed to the right information. And so just like everybody else, I've made it up as I've gone along. Um, and that's why it's really, really important that we reach girls and boys, actually, because we can't change this world for women with, without boys and men involved. Um, with the right information, the right products, the right services that you can, in your own terms, within your own culture, um, learn about the facts, almost taking a wholesome approach to these issues, um, such as, you know, weight and, and health and uh, what does your vagina look like, you know, and have you ever looked at your vagina? Um, and, you know, the, also, you know, when I talk about why do we have these issues, also porn, porn is so freely available now for anyone to watch and 
very sadly, it's where children now, young adults now, get their education on what we should look like and you know what what love and sex means. Often they're getting it from from porn, um, which is just wrong. But the, idea, but the idea, Kate, that a lot of um, information is coming from porn. Like, let's let's talk about that a little bit because we can't stop the access to that. And no. children, I mean, I'm talking about like babies, ten years old, can get access to it because just having access to your phone means yeah. that whole world opens mm -hmm. up. What do yeah. we do about that? Well, you're right. We're never going to stop porn, um, and. Um, it's it's about getting the right information out there. You know, I've been doing this for years with my work with PSI and Maverick Collective, um, where we have to change behavior. Um, although you can see that my co-partner in crime, the Crown Princess of Norway, um, you know, we together with her, you know, we've we've traveled the world and we've got to know um, you know, girls and women and, and how they've had access to their to their um, uh, education around sexual reproductive health and and just just the basics and so so it really is about um, putting out messages in a way that people can relate to in a, a way that their cultural their cultural background allows speaking their language but also delivering it in a way that's cool and trendy and relatable and bringing in thought leaders and influencers and experts that can talk about this actually in a medical way so that we remove the stigma that we have from our bodies. And we we, we do. Every woman feels that stigma. You know, when it comes to have, getting our period or having our period, it's like, you know, do you have a, you know, do you have a tampon? I mean, wh why is this so strange that we're still having these conversations in the 21st century um, about how our bodies operate and how it's embarrassing and why. You know, I go to Davos every year and the conversations around uh, erectile dysfunction are on every corner. Um, meanwhile, we're not talking about what a woman needs and, and the basics behind how a woman's body operates. And I believe that if we can reduce the stigma, bring this into mainstream in an acceptable, wholesome way that families can also talk about where we can deliver that information and deliver those products. Um, you know, menopause, for instance. Menopause is such, such stigma. You talk, it's called the change of life. Your life isn't changing, it's actually getting better. Your period stops. Well, I have to say, you know, with that, like, <laughs> When I was going through perimenopause, um, I would go into those, you know, those hot, those sweats, and I'd be in a meeting across the table at a lunch from, you know, a guy, and I would, I, I got to the point where I just said, "I'm having a hot flash. Give me a moment." Yeah. And people, like when I told my girlfriends that, they're like, "You actually said that?" I'm like, "Yeah, it's happening. There's nothing yeah. I can do about it, and it's uncomfortable, and it makes them feel uncomfortable unless I say what it is. So I might as well just put it out." Yeah. Well, I think what's interesting is talk about things like this more. It's yeah. normal and natural. And there's nothing else we can we not, there's nothing we can do about it. No, I mean, let's be honest. Um, we're all with our girlfriends over our cocktails or tea, and you know, we're talking about these things, and it's like hush, hush, let's hope nobody's listening. Um, and you know, that's why the menopause market, which we're very much going to focus on with the body agency, um, is so huge because there's so little information on products out there we don't know where to go we don't know who to believe and you know we've got our regular channels to go to a doctor it's horrifying we go in to see a doctor and we have to talk about these things often it's a man we're embarrassed why are we embarrassed we've come so far with our evolution our body is our power as a 50 year old woman i have never <laughs> felt so empowered and gorgeous and um, successful, and it's because I understand my body and I understand my power as a woman, and I want every single woman in the world to, to feel me. Yes, and it took me into my 40s and now early 50s to feel empowered about myself and to love myself more 
and be open about it. And I want to talk about the body agency, which you just mentioned. It's a startup health organization that you started during COVID, I believe. Yes. Talk about the idea of culturally sensitive products in the approach to solving women's health issues, because culture is an issue around the world in talking about this and then also bringing those products into our lives. Sure. Um, Well, yes, I got the idea of the body agency because for the last 20 years, I've worked with this incredible organization and and helped build it, a PSI, Population Services International. And um, my inspiration came when I started Maverick Collective with Melinda Gates and the Crown Princess of Norway. And PSI um, is the implementing partner. So together with our incredible Mavericks, these Maverick women who have been investing in uh, true innovation around around women's health, women's sexual health. Uh, we've been testing out these ideas around the world, and um, I realized that there was such a huge gap in not just getting the products out there, but also developing a platform uh, for uh, educating and and just giving the facts. The facts: What is menopause? What are periods? How do you do it? What contraception is available? What destroys your body? What doesn't destroy your body? Here are the facts by credible people. And so together with actually some of those Maverick Collective members, we were really talking about taking a private sector approach to and a social enterprise approach to delivering this um, information and these different incredible products. So yes, during COVID, I decided to start this company and went off on a a fundraising crusade, Uh, actually uh, raised uh, actually over a million dollars very quickly um, because I think that people recognize that this is our time. Um, Everything is lined up for us now. And if we don't take it and we don't take action now and put, put the infrastructure in place for women to have access, to um, medically accurate information without stigma, without shame, and then what are the best products to overcome those hot flushes? Or even how do I talk to my daughter and my son about a woman's body? How do I start with my 12-year-old daughter in talking to her about what's gonna happen to her body, her periods? Why does she have a clitoris? The only reason she has a clitoris is for pleasure. That's it. Why are we hiding that? It's the best thing in the world. So, you know, I want to, uh, together with our investors now, who are all leaning into the company and bringing their talent, their knowledge, um, their expertise and their treasure to the table, um, you know, how do we work on this sort of world domination of delivering sexual wellness uh, and health products um, to to women and girls around the world, and one of my favorite ideas is the uh, coming of age box for boys, um, where we will talk to boys about well, what is a woman, how does she operate, what are her parts, and how and, and you know how do they operate um, as a way of bringing great real men into the world, not men who have gotten their sexual education from porn. Let's take a look at a video that you created about Maverick Collective so people can really get a good idea of what you're doing. My vision is to build a global network of champions who will become experts and advocates for girls and women, solving problems, establishing lasting solutions to ultimately break the cycle of poverty. I truly believe we can do that through investing in women. My name's Kate, and I'm the founder of Maverick Collective. We have... So as the founder of Maverick Collective, Mm -hmm. what I love that you say, Kate, is that we change the future by creating it. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at philanthropy and generating impact, not just with money, but with empathy. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about what that means. Um, Well, first of all, it's always a collective effort. You know, not one person can change the world. And when we come up, when we came up with the idea of Maverick Collective, I actually went out on a crusade to handpick women who I felt could do this work with empathy, checking their ego in at the door 
and really understanding, going, going to the field, listening to real women, understanding their needs, getting educated, not just giving money. So going beyond the checkbook of how do you do this? Um, and Maverick Collective uh, in the beginning was purely philanthropic uh, because we needed the seed money to test out the innovation so that we could then take that innovation to scale across the world. So, you know, very quick story, cervical cancer um, is one of the biggest issues that women suffer from around the world. And we found a, an innovation where you swab a woman's cervix with white vinegar. And if she has if she has cancerous cells, it will bubble up. And then you could just freeze off the cancerous cells, boom. Uh, costs a few cents to do. We could add it on to our existing infrastructure of clinics. Uh, it went to scale across India, and now we're in the process of taking that very simple innovation to scale across the world. Sounds very simple. Um, it is because we have the right collaborative in place, and all of those different players are approaching this work with understanding and empathy and creativity and also taking a business approach. And so you know those are the those are the those are the things i believe in all those things and without empathy um you, you really are not going to get very far because very soon you will uncover why somebody is doing what they're doing and and to to be honest you know we need businesses we we need businesses to have this objective as as part of their sustainability and their csr but we also need businesses to approach this with empathy but as an individual <laughs> You don't have to have a lot of money to get involved in something. Um, empathy is a big part of it. And of course it takes money, but I, I'm trying to see how, if someone's listening and watching right now and says, but I want to make a difference, how do I do it if I don't have a lot of money? Um, I think that everyone, even if they don't have a lot of money, um, you know, Ma Maverick is a, a global scale, you know, philanthropic organization. And, you know, whether it's $10 or $10 million, you, you can absolutely have an impact um, with, with that on the money side. But I truly believe that, you know, I, I, I say this till the cows come home, it's really not about just money. It's about you applying yourself. I don't have money. Uh, I was born in a little fishing village in the north of England and grew up on my dad's ship. Um, very glamorous life, but without money. And it, the reason I believe that I was able to make an impact is because I, I got educated. I learned about the issues. I spent time studying. I learned a craft, which was marketing. Um, and I applied that in partnership with PSI in the beginning to create these various initiatives that I felt served a gap uh, in between what the governments were doing and what the private sector was doing. And I found my niche in where I could be successful, but that wasn't money for me. It was applying myself in the right way um, and putting my experience to work. And that is often way more impactful than throwing money at it, but it needs to be a combination of all of those things, uh, applying your your time, your talent, and your and your treasure, whatever that treasure may be. We talked to a lot of uh, leaders during this summit in this space about the fact that it's not just body shape, right? It's race, color, gender, age, disability, sexuality. The intersection of all of these things plays into body image. We talked a little bit about the role that men play here. Um, give us a little bit more about what you're doing to bring men to the table in this yeah. conversation and in action. Um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm thrilled to say that I have men as investors in the body agency. Um, one is a, a pro athlete, uh, NBA player, um, who, um, you know, he's obviously very famous. He, he comes from a whole uh, family of NBA players, and he is a father first and foremost, and he has a little girl and boys, and he is a huge believer that it really, you do, it, everything you get in the beginning is from your parents. Mm -hmm. And so we have a strategy to reach parents um, with uh, ways to speak to their children about this and give them the products in a non-embarrassing form that that can that can reach their children, but then 
we, we're going to make cool, right? We're going to make it a desirable uh, thing to have. And we're going to have to do that through influencers and through peers. Um, but first step is, is parents. Um, and, you know, this could be a dad talking to his daughter. This could be a mother talking to her son. And it's making sure that they have in their hands the right products and services in order for, to empower them. You bring race up. Um, and, you know, we need way more time than we have to really delve into this. But, you know, one of the biggest issues in the world that women suffer from is an issue called vaginismus. Most people can't even say it, let alone understand what it is. But, you know, in the U.S. alone, um, 25 million women suffer from this. And this is basically, you know, can happen at any age, but it's the inability to actually have sex. It just won't go in. It's too dry. You're too afraid. A lot of issues happen within cultural and religious with uh, boundaries. Um, and, you know, it's a huge problem. It will prevent you from procreating. So we are looking to really talk about this in a, in, in a medical way and bring the true innovation to the table that can treat it in an affordable way that can also reach different races and uh, under different cultural banners um, in a way that that is acceptable. Um, and it's, it's, gonna, it's a big job and it's gonna take a lot of different creative strategies. Um, men are men are very important to this. You know, there, there are men doctors, there are husbands, there's brothers, there's, there's um, um, gynecologists, um, just regular men are going to be the, one of the big driving forces behind this. And, you know, we're going up against huge social uh, mediums um, that, you know, I was I was thrilled to to uncover the innovation around male circumcision as a way to um, reduce the spread of HIV AIDS. You know, if, if an African man is, is circumcised, he's 60 percent less likely to contract HIV. Now, if we can get grown men African men into clinics in Africa to have the slice, um, then we can get um, we can get men and women to care about women's issues and change that behavior. And it's as simple as that. The cultural aspect is just so crucial here. I mean, having lived it myself, I know exactly what you're talking about because of not being able to actually being petrified that my father would find out that I got my period or I even wore a bra. <laughs> you know, and exactly. fast forward uh, to now where my daughter can openly talk to her dad about these things. So there's progress, but it's definitely very slow and a huge, huge piece of this. And, you know, the fact is, Kate, that you are doing powerful things leading toward action and changing people's perceptions and changing the way that they see themselves. And as you know, this conference is dedicated to providing actionable advice to the audience about how to create a more inclusive world. How do we do that, Kate, in this space? We absolutely need to collaborate. Um, no one person can do this on their own. Um, once you identify your passion, um, focus, 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 straight to, uh, stay true to your passion, get your elevator speech down and seek out beneficial partnerships. Um, that's that's how I've done this. Um, I haven't recreated the wheel. I've worked with incredible organizations like PSI um, and I have um, brought in the right champions to be able to do this. Um, and that's really, that those are the words I would give to people listening in. Um, and, you know, feel free to reach out to me. I would be very happy to to mentor anyone or collaborate with them if it makes sense for the mission uh, and what you're trying to do. But we are so much more powerful as a collective, as a collaborative, um, where people stay in their lanes and do what they're good at. And, and then we meet in the middle. But passion drives it. Passion, measured impact and collaboration. And it's in the empathy and we can do this. We can absolutely do this. Yeah. From your work with PSI, Population Services International, to the Maverick Collective, to the Body Agency, and so many other initiatives creating a more inclusive world and change in the future for women. And you are, Kate, officially now one of my favorite people. Thank you so oh. much for being here with us during this summit and for your work. 
Thank you for doing this, Monica. It's been an absolute delight. I'm so excited for what you're doing. Congratulations. Thank you so much. And you have been watching Our Body is Power, creating a positive mental representation of ourselves. This has been part of the Non-Obvious Diversity Summit. And thank you for watching. Check out all the other topics we're covering because we have brought together voices from all genres, genders, and geographies. For more fascinating conversations like this, visit non-obviousdiversity.com. Our official summit hashtag is non-obviousdiversity. I'm Monica Samtani from the FemWord and the entire team here. Remember to always stay non-obvious. <laughs> <laughs>